So today's webinar, again, entitled Functional Support and Memory, a Perspective Analysis of the CLSA Comprehensive Cohort, is being presented by Samantha Yu. And Samantha is a PhD student in Epidemiology and Public Health at the University of Ottawa. She's researching public health effects of folate and vitamin B12 deficiency at a global level and assessing relevant public health po policies. She also works as a data analyst at the Genetics and Gen Genome Biology Program at the SickKids Research Institute. Samantha completed her Master's of Science in Epidemiology and Biostats at the University of Waterloo uh, in 2021, where she studied the association between functional social support and memory among middle-aged and older adults in Canada using three-year data from the CLSA. Her research interests uh, include epidemiological methods, causal models, evidence synthesis, and chronic disease epidemiology. And now I will pass it on to our presenter to get started. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen first, and I hope everybody can see me. Yeah, so. Without further ado, I'll just go on um, with my presentation. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Shirley and Jennifer and the um, rest of the CLSA team for this wonderful opportunity to share my research today. And hello and thank you to everyone um, for logging on today. I know that everybody is very busy at the end of the year. I hope um, you find the presentation today very interesting. I'm not sure how many of you are engaged in research related to social support and or cognitive function and or memory using the CLSA data. I've also heard um, from the organizers that uh, some of you may be from the general public, not directly um, conducting researches yourselves. So I did prepare some um, background sliders <clears throat> um, with definitions and context um, and classifications and so, and so forth. Let me begin. So this is just an opening slide just to show you the prevalence of um, dementia, although dementia was not um, the focus of my study. It's a, it's a severe form of neurocognitive disorder. You can see here that the prevalence is, has been going up and it's a little higher among women than men and the risk of dementia uh, goes up dramatically after the age of 65. Um, and when we look at um, this severe form of neurocognitive disorder, so dementia, we can easily imagine that this condition requires a lot of support from caregivers and families in many different forms, such as helping with daily routines, reminding medications, providing cognitive stimulations, and so forth. So this makes it very challenging, as you can imagine, for people with cognitive declines to live through a pandemic as we are. Uh, today, as in-person care in many different forms become very limited and daily routines, which are important um, for folks with cognitive declines, become disrupted and restricted in many ways. And according to research, approximately 40% of dementia cases can be prevented or delayed. And, um, and this is an important part of the information for um, as a context of my research, as prevention is one of the key focus areas of Canada's dementia strategy, which was published just last year. Now, uh, moving on to the main part of my presentation. Um, first, um, I'll, I'd like to go over some definitions, classifications, and some background um, theoretical information about the um, elements um, included in my study. So this is how of cognition is defined under the um, DSM 5th edition. Cognition is a complex um, thing that comprises of these six different domains. We have learning and memory, executive function, perceptual motor function, language, social cognition, and complex attention. And if we zoom in on <clears throat> memory particularly, um, it's typically classified into these four subtypes, episodic memory, semantic memory, implicit memory, and working memory. Episodic memory refers to an ability to actively retrieve personal experiences in personal contexts. Um, and implicit memory is about recalling past experiences without much conscious effort, like riding a bike, for instance. Semantic memory is holding a structured record of facts, concepts, and knowledge like uh, the things we learn in school and education system. 
working memory is storing and using information for short time periods, recalling the grocery list as we were doing grocery shopping at the supermarket. So these are the examples. And as you can imagine, memory supports many facets of our lives, maintaining relationships, performing job functions, putting things into context, and ultimately maintaining functional independence. And while many of us think that memory loss is a natural part of aging process, memory impairment that goes beyond a certain point is not part of normal aging. And that is linked to higher risk of neurocognitive disorders. Episodic memory has been reported as one of the first domains impaired in cognitive decline process. And impaired episodic memory would look like being unable to remember <clears throat> your latest family trip or making many simple mistakes performing the tasks that used to be very familiar to you. And this can lead to feelings of uncertainty, frustration, fear, and depression. Working memory is another domain that uh, declines substantially with age, and this affects day, uh, daily task performances, like reading, writing, making plans, and also increased distraction. So cognitive decline occurs on a continuum from minimal to severe, impacting a single domain or multiple domains at the same time. Normal age-related cognitive changes are small and they do not undermine daily functions. Mild neurocognitive disorder uh, also does not undermine um, our ability to perform daily activities, but activities may be performed at suboptimal levels and may require some more effort. Now, major neurocognitive disorder or dementia is characterized by a progressive loss of functional independence. So individuals ultimately lose the ability to perform the basic tasks of daily living. So we know that age is the greatest risk factor, one of the greatest risk factors for cognitive decline. But other than that, what other factors are known to accelerate or prevent cognitive decline? A lot of research has been done on biological factors, as you can see on the slide. Some genes, some hormones, notably apolipoprotein E4 allele, have been found to be associated with the onset or progression of um, cognitive decline. And out of many clinical research, we now know about the associations between several health conditions, as you can see here on the list, um, and increased risks of cognitive impairment. And many of these health conditions are also associated with the lifestyle and psychosocial factors, as you can see below. Lifestyle risk factors predicting poor cognitive function are physical inactivity, smoking, excessive alcohol use, and fatty diets. Psychosocial risk factors have been relatively less studied. The existing literature largely focuses on depression, stress, and social environment. And social environment is what I'll be talking about as it relates to social support. And increased social support has been cited as a potential buffer against cognitive loss in older adults. So moving on to social support. Social support refers to the social resources that we can use to help with making decisions, um, solving problems, and in general, maintaining positive experiences in life. People use different terminologies to describe different aspects of social support, uh, like um, social engagement, social relations, social integration, social activities, and so forth. But conceptually, social support has structural and functional um, aspects. Structural social support refers to the size of the social network, like how many people do you know, and the frequency of social contacts, uh, like how often do you meet with these people, um, for interaction. And on the other hand, functional social support is about the perceived nature of social relationships. Things like, do you have close friends? Do you get practical help and support, emotional support when you, when you need them? You know, are you satisfied um, with these relationships? So the Medical Outcomes Study Social Support Survey is a tool that measures functional social support specifically, and it breaks it down into four components, as you can see at the very bottom of the tree. Um, so emotional informational support is about having someone that understands you, having someone that can give you advice, and that you can share your deepest worries with. Tangible support 
is about having someone that can help you with chores, errands, driving you to a doctor when you're sick. Affection and support, um, as you can imagine, is having someone who we can share love and affection with. And positive social interactions is about having someone to have fun with, to do leisurely activities with, or for positive distractions. So just based on these definitions, what subtype of functional social support do you think is likely most strongly associated with cognitive decline or memory function or most weakly associated? You can drop your text in the chat box. Um, I'm waiting to see if any chats come in. But um, this was a question that I asked myself um, a lot during my own research, imagining different people in different scenarios, different environments. And I kept coming to a thought that functional social support may be an evolving thing, um, taking different forms at different stages in life, or even taking different effect um, on your cognition, depending on your circumstances or even personality traits. And actually, My slide. Yeah. So actually, it's important to take a lifespan approach as our needs and our perceptions change as we live into older ages. And there are some theories that describe how functional social support works throughout the lifespan. The first two models, the social convoy model and the social emotional selectivity model, they explain that we maintain a stable level of social relationships throughout our lives but the makeup of these relationships change with time and age. For, for example, as we age, we may shed less important, more formal um, relationships uh, to focus more on more important, more rewarding and more intimate relationships. And the second one, functional specificity model, says that our need for a specific type of support can be best fulfilled by certain individuals. And if that support comes from somebody else, it might not have the same effect. A solidarity conflict model is also very interesting. It suggests that support and conflict may coexist in close and cohesive relationships. And we experience love and tension simultaneously in close relationships, as opposed to having relationships that are always positive or always negative. So then how does functional social support affect cognitive health? A majority of the studies reported that higher level of functional social support predicted higher global cognition. Higher perceived social support was found to be associated with higher cognitive function, both globally and across different domains, and also predicted a slower decline in cognition as well. Emotional informational support uh, showed, the strong, showed the strongest association with higher cognitive performance among older adults. And in terms of memory, High level of functional social support predicted delays in memory decline among older adults conduct in research is conducted in many different um, countries. And a number of potential mechanisms explain this association between functional social support and cognition. The most relevant one in the context of my research, so functional social support is the first one there, stress buffering hypothesis, which explains that chronic stress arising from poor or no social support can lead to permanent loss of hippocampal neurons and structural damages to the hippocampus. Stressors trigger elevation of cortisol levels and this impairs the cognition. And also stressors can induce structural damages in the hippocampus, which is one of the key regions that uh, regulate cognitive function. So under the stress buffering hypothesis, social support may serve as a cushion against stressors. For instance, you may perceive a potentially stressful situation a little differently if you know that helpful resources will be available to you. Or if others around you help you think that the problem that you perceive as stressful is actually solvable or acceptable or not as bad as you think. There are um, three other mechanisms um, that I put here on the slide. But in, in the interest of time, I'd just like to move on to the next slide. Um, if you're interested, you can, you can discuss them over the question and answer session, or you can look them up yourself at your own um, time. So just summing up the literature um, search that I have done, 
a majority of the studies uh, show positive associations between functional social support and cognitive function in older adults. And this may be explained by multiple theoretical mechanisms. However, there were some um, gap in the literature as well, limited evidence around whether age and sex moderated the association between these two uh, variables. And there was also a significant heterogeneity in how um, social support is defined and measured. Many studies um, fell short of distinguishing um, between structural versus functional social support. <clears throat> and different scales were used to measure the functional social support as well. So it was very difficult to compare across different studies. And also a lot of those studies um, in the literature were limited in scope um, as well, focusing only on older adults uh, above the age of 65 uh, or focusing just on um, certain cities or certain provinces or certain states. So CLSA was a wonderful platform to overcome these potential gaps in the literature. And so based on these, um, <clears throat> the existing evidence and the gaps in the literature, I came up with these uh, three research questions. I was inter interested in finding out uh, the baseline level of association um, between functional social support and changes in memory score over three years in a community dwelling Canadians aged between 45 and 85. And if this association maintained after controlling for different potential confounders, and if this association was modified by age and sex. Um, this is just a, um, a brief slide on how the CLSA cohorts are formed. Um, and the sampling frame and the inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, I think many of you would be familiar with the uh, CLSA framework as a research platform, so I don't want to dwell too long here. And I just want to jump to how I came to my own analytical sample from the comprehensive cohort. So the baseline sample size of the comprehensive cohort um, was about 30,097. And over the course of the first three years, um, we lost about 8% of that population due to different reasons as stated here. And, and uh, participants who either withdrew or dropped out were generally older, um, had lower level of education, lower level of income, and poor level of self-rated health compared to those who remained in the study until the first wave of the follow-up three years later. And the analytical sample, if you see the flowchart on the right side, um, I did a complete case analysis. So I filtered everyone who did the regular testing at the data collection site at both time points, baseline and follow-up. And I only included those who had full, uh, who had complete memory scores at baseline and follow-up, and also full uh, complete you know, functional social support scores at baseline and complete values for covariate, um, covariates at baseline. So my final sample size was 12,011 participants. Now I'd like to briefly go over how I operationalized the um, functional social support and memory. So first, I did this, this was the outcome variable. Um, the auditory verbal learning test was the single uh, memory measure used in the CLSA. In short, I'll just call it RAVEL. So it does measure um, immediate recall and delayed recall. Um, and I standardize it into Z scores separately for English and French speaking participants. They had different means. <clears throat> um, and as you can see, I combined these two um, immediate recall and delayed recall st scores into a composite Ravel Z score. So I averaged them um, as you can see. And this was because they had comparable distributions at both time points. And also because of the literature does not distinguish uh, separately how the delayed recall versus immediate recall or vice versa is associated with cognitive decline or memory. They, for the most part, if they did measure both um, separate recalls, uh, they combined them into a composite score and analyzed them as a single entity of memory score. And the final outcome variable um, was the difference in the memory score between baseline and follow-up, uh, calling it a change score here. And this was computed by subtracting the um, combined memory score at baseline from the combined memory score at follow-up. Moving on to the functional social support variable, 
um, the medical outcome studies, social support survey, MOS SSS was used to measure the functional social support um, in the CLSA cohort. And this is a 19 item self administered survey that measures overall and four different subtypes of the functional social support. You can see the list of the 19 questions on the slide and how each question is assigned to a subtype, except the last item, which um, was computed to an overall score. So each question, um, the participants are asked to rate the level of support on the scale of five, one to five. One is none of the time, two a little of the time, to all the way to five all the time. And for analysis, I dichotomize the functional social support score into high or low, with the high being scores four or higher, and the low being less than four, to account for the skewed distribution um, of the score. And other than the predictor and the outcome variables, I included 12 uh, covariates in the analysis, all of them informed by the literature, um, to control for potential confounding. I only used the baseline value of these covariates, but their distributions remained unchanged throughout the three years. And as per the CLSA recommendations, I included the participants' age, sex, and province of residence as a priori variable in all of the models. And now to this, for the st statistical analysis, I did complete case analysis. Um, I will discuss it later, but the, the nature of missingness, missingness in the outcome of the particular variables did not appear to be um, at random or at complete at random. So complete case analysis was a safer approach. So I ran five sets of uh, multiple linear regressions, um, each for the functional social support overall um, and subtypes. And for each set, a base model included age, sex, um, province, as well as the baseline memory score as informed by the literature. And the full model included all the covariates. Um, each full model was then um, assessed for, or, uh, was stratified by um, age and sex as well. And um, each of the full model was assessed for fit using um, diagnostics, the residual plot, and the observed versus predictive plots. And also to assess the potential impact of missing data, I conducted a bivariate sensitivity analysis to examine the differences in the distribution of the functional social support among people with complete versus missing memory values, and um, also distribution of the memory scores among people with complete social support scores versus missing social support scores. So now the results. Um, first, I'd like to just go over the descriptive uh, statistics the characteristics of the participants at baseline. This is all weighted. As you can see, sex was evenly distributed uh, between male and female, but age was not. Um, you can see that over 70% of the participants was under 65 years and only 11% uh, over 75 years or older. And in terms of the province, Quebec and British Columbia accounted for the, for the largest share. And education, over 85% of the participants at baseline had some post-secondary education. And as for the annual household income, a little over 43% um, of the participants had over $100,000 per year. And the distributions of uh, marital status and living arrangements over overlapped almost exactly with 75% in marital or common law relationships and living with someone. And majority of the participants were healthy, as you can see. Um, almost 70% of the participants um, had one or no chronic condition, and over 90% had no functional impairment at all. And only 9% suffered reported as current smokers. So overall, we get this picture of the participants as um, younger, so young old adults, less than um, younger than 65 years of age, with a high level of education, high level of income, and in relatively good health. Now let's take a look at um, their functional social support scores at baseline. The distribution is left skewed, as you can see on the right side of the screen, with the median scores of all var variables ranging from 4.33 to 4.70 out of um, five. And 75% of the participants scored 4.8 or higher in each subtype. 
So when categorized into high or low scores, 92 to 95% of the participants reported high functional social support. And um, these distributions were sustained over three years. And, and um, the functional social support scores were comparable across different age and sex strata. In all strata, over 90% of the participants reported high scores for each functional um, social support variable. Now moving on to the memory scores, um, these are the standardized um, rabble scores. In the table, you can see the scores for immediate recall, delayed recall, rabble 1, rabble 2, um, and rabble combined, the combined memory score. And all three distributions were comparable at each time point. The mean score decreased slightly from baseline to follow up by about 0.25. And how did the memory scores change over three years? We can see that 57% of the participants experienced a decline in their memory over three years, while the rest had their scores increase. And although not shown here, over half of those who, inclined, who in, declined or increased had small increases or small decreases, a change of less than one point. One point. So we have this uh, normal distribution of change score. Um, with the mean at um, negative 0.24. And when we slice it by age and sex, we see some differences. First, the change scores were the largest magnitude of negative in the youngest age group. So that's 45 to 54 years, which means that they had the largest decline compared to other age groups. In contrast, the largest positive was seen in the oldest age group, 75 years or older, which means they had the biggest improvement in the memory scores over three years. And you can see in the table here that the mean and the median of the change scores actually increase with each older age group. And between the sexes, female participants um, showed substantially larger magnitude of negative compared to males. Now let's look at regression um, analysis results uh, in both the base model and the full models. The regression coefficients for functional social support were rather small. So in terms of the direction of the association, the regression coefficients being positive indicates that high versus low baseline functional social support is associated with an increase in memory change score, which means more improvement. But then also the 95% um, confidence interval uh, contains the null value here, so we were not so this was not very conclusive. And in terms of the magnitude of the association, a larger positive regression coefficient would mean a greater increase in the memory scores over three years. So here at the mod in my models, the magnitude of the regression coefficients were small, and probably because the increases in the change scores, the memory change scores, were less than one point for approximately half of the participants in whom the change scores actually increased. Um, tangible support at the largest, and it was the only statistically significant variable um, having an effect on across all models. And all other subtypes had their 95% um, confidence intervals, including the null uh, value. So, starting, starting from the full models by age and sex, um, first uh, looking at the age groups, none of the coefficients were statistically significant um, at the 5% level. And the 95% confidence interval, as you can see, was the widest for the oldest age group, as this group had a smaller sample size. And by sex, um, the tangible support from males had the largest and the only statistically significant effect. And now this is about the impact of the missing data, impact of in excluding participants with um, missing data. So comparing the group with missing values showed con consistent results. And first, um, participants with missing memory scores at baseline reported lower scores on all five functional social support variables compared to those who had complete memory scores. And at the three-year follow-up, uh, those with missing memory scores had equal or lower baseline functional social support scores as well. And these were statistically different differences, uh, statistically significant differences. Um, continuing participants with um, missing functional social support scores also reported lower mean memory scores at baseline 
but slightly higher mean memory scores at follow up. And the pattern was consistent across all five variables of functional social support. The differences were not specifically significant for the affectionate support, tangible support, um, and positive social interactions. For overall um, support and emotional information and support, the differences were statistically significant. So just briefly capping the findings, the regression models did not suggest a strong association between functional social support and memory change over three years among the middle and older age Canadians, um, except for tangible support. Um, all of the 95% confidence intervals included a null value and you couldn't conclude with certainty about the direction of the association. And after controlling for confounders, the magnitude of the association diminished slightly and tangible support was the only variable that had statistically significant um, effect on memory change in the fully adjusted models. And the evidence for effect modification by age and sex was not evident. So the results was, uh, were a little different from um, what I expected. And so I, I spent a fair amount of time revisiting the literature and trying to get some insights from the previous studies. And I narrowed, the, narrowed down the literature to these five studies that were most comparable to my own research, the larger scale, longitudinal design, um, looking specifically at functional social support um, as a predictor and um, studying cognitively healthy adults who are also middle-aged or older. And all of these um, studies reported a positive association between functional social support and cognition. But then if you read closely, um, their predictor and the outcome variables are slightly differently defined than mine. So comparison was not so feasible. Meanwhile, a few articles reported inverse or um, null associations between functional social support and cognition. And different explanations were pro provided by these authors. Some cited um, reciprocity theory, which is simply um, you know, receiving social support that you cannot reciprocate due to illness or other limitations may cause stress, anxiety, and depressive moods, and this may um, affect cognitive function negatively. But this is not really relevant to my research because as you understand, my participants were uh, healthy without much functional impairment. Um, and there was also a little um, description of uh, the dis uh, distinction between fluid and crystallized intelligence and how this may affect um, the association, the direction of the association, but we need more research to, to map different cognitive domains and tests to different types of intelligence. And as for the sex differences, some authors explain that for men, high level of tangible support at baseline may also indicate incident um, declines in cognitive function because men typically have less intensive networks of social uh, support. And so if they are experiencing a cognitive decline, they may actively seek support to maintain their function. But then this again may not be relevant to the CLS example, given their characteristics. Other valid uh, uh, possible um, rationale relevant to my research um, include detecting um, cognitive changes using neuropsychological tests would be difficult in non or pre-pathological stages of cognitive impairment. And so, so longer follow-ups and more marked declines in cognitive change would be needed to ascertain the association between these two um, variables of interest. And also a selection bias in favor of participants who perform better than average on memory test was identified in one study. And this may um, be relatable to my, my own research as well. But um, overall, uh, further research um, is needed and currently the evidence is uh, quite limited. And so applying these um, insights to my own research, the sample used in my research was younger, physically healthier than the typical sample studied in this field. And um, my participants may have needed less functional su support um, compared to uh, those in other studies. And um, the analytical sample drawn from the baseline CLS data set may not have been optimal for assessing changes in memory over a three year period. As well, a large, uh, a large proportion of the analytical sample was cognitively healthy because a CLS is screened out persons with overt signs of cognitive impairment at recruitment. 
And adding to that, the level of commitment required to participate in the CLSA comprehensive cohort um, testing may have de-incentivized older adults with maybe some small signs of cognitive challenges from taking part in the study. And so this may have resulted in the recruitment of highly selective subgroup of cognitively healthy older adults. And if you recall, the oldest age group in my analysis showed the largest improvement in memory over three years. And the number of people with memory score improvement was twice as many in the older age group than the younger age groups. And lastly, given the cognitively healthy sample, a three-year follow-up was unlikely to be long enough um, to detect changes in memory. Other studies with relatively short to medium follow-ups on people without cognitive impairment also found some muted results. So wrapping up the presentation with strengths and limitations of the research. Uh, the scope of the CLSA was a, was a big strength um, that I was able to benefit from. Um, the CLSA covered middle <clears throat> and um, older aged community dwelling adults from seven out of 10 provinces. Um, and this contrasts really well with many other previous studies with limited target populations. And also the wealth of uh, and the longitudinal analysis. The longitudinal design um, helped me mitigate the reversal causation um, bias. Um, and wealth of covariates, um, I was able to control for almost all of the potential confounders cited in the literature as well. And the MOS SSS scale used to measure the functional social support were well validated and um, reported for a high, high level of reliability. And also, I was able to look at memory as a distinct outcome um, because many, in many other research, memory is just included as one of the cognitive domains and usually just um, combined into the cognitive, global cognitive score. And these are the limitations. Um, CLS participants were volunteers and, and they, they reported higher level of education, income, and health. Um, compared to the average persons in the same age range in Canada. Um, and they also um, reported very tight and left skewed distributions of functional social support scores at both time points, which could have uh, reduced the variability needed to detect the differences in, in memory um, change scores across the entire spectrum of the functional social support. Another possible selection bias may have occurred at a, uh, a participant's um, who showed overt signs of cognitive impairment were screened out at baseline. And attrition of people um, who are generally older and at lower level of education, income, and health may also have resulted in some selection bias. Um, also, the proportion of participants with missing memory scores increased um, with approx from approximately 4% at baseline to about 22% at follow-up and after excluding all other um, participants with missing values in different variables used in the analysis, the analytical sample was reduced about 40% of the baseline cohort. And one last um, point there is the absence of normative data. Um, having a normative um, data for the functional social support, the MOS SSS scale or RABL score would have been helpful in interpreting the, the scale scores and the magnitude of the revision coefficients in light of the benchmark, indicating the type of scores that you would expect in an average population. So um, as a conclusion, um, my research found a, a very weak um, association between functional social support and memory over three years um, in the comprehensive cohort of CLSA. At a descriptive level, um, approximately half of the participants had their memory scores increase and the other half decrease. Um, the tangible support was significantly associated with higher change scores in memory, and the evidence of effect modification by sex or age was not clear. We would need um, longer follow-up to, to be able to detect uh, clearer associations between functional social support and memory. So this is it for the presentation. Um, I haven't heard anything from Shirley, so I, I hope I didn't go over time. I think, uh, thank you so much, Samantha, that was great. Um, we do have some, uh, just first of all, just a reminder to post your questions um, if, you if you have any. I know there's actually been a lot of discussion already. Um, the first few questions uh, went back to, I think if you, 
um, think back to your method slides. Um, there were some questions about why you, um, whether you included non-marital relationships. Um, also, why you didn't include physical activity or race as covariants. Right, to answer the first question first, um, um, non, I included, so I include the living arrangements, what, which was um, living alone versus living with somebody. Um, and as for the marital status, there was common law relationships, uh, marital relationships, divorced, separated, widowed. Um, so I, and I grouped common law and marital relationships together. So I guess common law would be with, with, was included as a variable. Uh, did that answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And then the other parts were why you didn't include physical activity uh, and race. Right. Physical activity and race. Physical activity. Oh, oh, race. Race, yeah. <laughs> I did not specifically include the race or ethnicity, um, but I understand that um, from other research done on the CLSA that um, the language is spoken and ethnicity is included and represented in the CLSA um, were diverse. Um, and I wasn't able to see much in the literature um, preceding my, my um, research that ethnicity was a, a factor, a big risk factor, um, or confounder between functional social support and um, and cognition or memory. I did see some researchers um, done specifically on the, for instance, Chinese Americans or um, some Asians in the Asian pop in the Asian countries, um, or immigrant population in um, living in the Western world, and also some studies in, in the UK. Um, Scandinavian countries as well, but then um, the race itself didn't really come out as a, a big uh, risk factor or a confounder, um, not really discussed much in the literature, so that's why I excluded it, and I also didn't want to include too many um, um, covariates to adjust for because it could also kind of burden the models with um, overfitting as well, and physical activity, um, I did not include it because um, I was a little skeptical of how this could actually be measured. There's a lot of um, controversies around how physical activities can be. It's usually self-reported and it could be kind of subjective um, and um, it can't really, cannot really be have um, a physical activity level objectively and accurately measured. Um, so, and also it has some time varying um, nature as well. So depending on when you ask, um, you know, the answer could, could vary, right? So that would, um, having a time varying confounder in, in the model would also kind of complicate the analysis as well. And um, the relationship between physical activity and um, cognition is already been well established. Um, so I didn't really see the need to include it. Hope that answered the question. I think that was very comprehensive. Um, uh, also sort of methods related or analysis related, why did you not use inverse probability or censoring weights or multiple imputation to consider missing data? Right, uh, about the multiple imputation, I did consider um, imputing the missing values because we did have a lot of missingness and, and it was a concern um, towards the end. Um, but then to, to be able to impute um, using a robust model, we would need first, um, we would first should be able to assume that the missingness is uh, at random or completely at random, ideally, but I wasn't able to come to that conclusion. Um, and as, as you have heard, um, if you did the, if, you know, when you look at the sensitive analysis, the, um, the people with missing values had, were, um, reported lower level of, um, so people with missing memory scores reported lower level of functional social support and vice versa. So it wasn't, it didn't really seem as um, um, missing at random. So I did not think that it was safe to just go ahead and impute the data. Um, and the inverse, 
um, probability that um, propensity score, right? I I think that it could have been a could have been a good approach to kind of even out um, the different study um, samples, but it wasn't like we did, we had um, like an exposure group versus non-exposure group. Uh, of the, it, this was a cohort study, but um, um, the exposure group. So if I if you were to think that the exposure group was the group with a lower or higher um, level of social support, then the the distribution was very skewed, right? Um, <clears throat> but I I would be uh, very interested in actually going back and <clears throat> calculating the propensity scores and how that would kind of change the the analysis. That's interesting. Thank you. Great, good question. Um, and then there was just somebody just asked to clarify which su social support theoretical framework you use to measure functional support. Um, theoretical framework. <clears throat> Um, theoretical framework that I mentioned in the slides were the, the how social support would be associated with um, cognition or memory and stress buffering hypothesis was what I focused on as how that would explain the uh, association between support and cognition. Um, and then related to that, uh, how does emotional support <clears throat> differ from um, affection support? And what about affirmative support? Right, emotional, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> emotional informational support was um, was it was de defined in the um, MOSSS scale as um, having having a confidant, um, having a very close best friend that you can share your worries, fears, um, you can share your crisis with, that you can you can trust that you can get um, sound advice and support from versus affection support. Affection support is more of a, um, do you have anyone to, do you have someone to love, to share hugs, to share affection, to, to share affection with? So slightly different, but I get, but I, I also get the question because I think it's a lot of it would kind of overlap because in a, between spouses, you would get emotional, informational support as well. But some literature, actually uh, goes further and specify these and say emotional information and our support uh, comes best from friends compared to family members um, and affectionate support comes best from spouses. Okay. Yeah, I suppose these are difficult concepts to, to tease out from, from one another. Um, so hopefully that answered uh, Carolyn's question. Um, uh, the next question is, um, I'm not sure if you missed it, but did you see the moderation effect of age and sex? Um, no, I, the, the evidence was not clear. Okay. Yeah, by either age or sex, yeah. Okay. Um, and you also said the social support component is negatively skewed. How did you address this? Oh, the distribution of functional social support score at baseline was skewed. So um, a lot of people reported high level of social support, a functional social support at baseline and at followed as well. Um, so I dichotomized the, um, the variable into high and low to kind of account for the skewed nature of the distributions. And we might have already touched on this question, but could you please share which theoretical framework supports your classification of social support as structural and functional support? And what about quality of relationships? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. First part, the theoretical, um, the theoretical background to classifying so social support as functional versus structural, I have not really, aware of a specific theory that speaks to that, but um, going back to um, 1980s, um, well, initially starting from 1979, I think, um, from Dr. Berkman's, uh, Lisa Berkman's research, uh, that's when um, the association between social support in general and um, cognition in many different forms uh, started to be researched. 
and in, in, in the initial day um, here, a lot of the focus was on the structural aspect of social support. Um, how many people do you know? How big is your network size? Um, how often or do you talk to them? And how many hours do you spend? Um, and so forth. So, so the structural aspect were the key focus in the early years of the research in this field. But later on, um, we, there were, I remember reading an article about calling it a second wave. Um, and then people started to, to question um, the quality of the relationship is more important than the quantity and how you perceive that relationship uh, is more pertinent to when it comes to association risk or how it impacts cognition in general. So I think there was a, just a gradual transition um, as people were getting more aware of different components um, and aspects of social support. Um, I'm not really aware of a specific theory that says that, um, but there was that kind of like a divide um, when people kind of transitioned. And about the quality of the relationship, that's another um, construct I think that's also been used in um, measuring um, social support. So actually there are a lot more than just functional social support. There's also, uh, so quality could also mean positive or negative, right? So do you also, do you, um, do you also have like negative aspects of the relationships? Do you get like critiques or criti criticism or do you have tension and conflict a lot in the relationships? So that's usually when, um, when I read about the quality uh, of the relationships assessed in the literature, it's usually, is it negative or positive? But in this um, MOS that the scale, we didn't, um, uh, they, that scale doesn't measure that. So that was one of the limitations as to the scale. Uh, great. Um, well, we're coming towards the end of the webinar. Just a reminder, um, uh, if you have any questions, now's your last opportunity. So there's a couple of quick questions left. Um, and the next one is gonna be simple, but did you have missing data at baseline? Um, yes, I, I had missing data at baseline um, and covariates, functional social support, and um, and the mem and memory variables. You know, I had missing this in all of those at baseline as well, and they were excluded from the analysis, especially because uh, the predictor uh, variable and the covariates. I only used the the baseline. Right. Okay. Um. And uh, I just see Carolyn responded to your your response, and so I'll just let uh, um, maybe you read that after. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that pretty, oh, one more question. Okay, last one we'll get in. And how did you deal with that missing data at baseline? You talked about how you dealt with it at the follow-up. How did you deal with the baseline missing data? Right, so um, my research was not like done separately at baseline and follow-up. Uh, I narrowed down my analytical sample to those who had complete um, values at all the variables that I needed, right? So people who had missingness in the baseline um, variables that I, that I used, they were excluded, as well as those who had missing memory scores at, at follow-up. Okay. Well, that brings us to the, uh, we're almost at one o'clock. So uh, thank you again to all our presenters. I hope uh, I hope we answered all your questions. Um, if not, you can always follow up via email to uh, the CLSA or to Samantha directly. Uh, we really appreciate your participation in the webinar series. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that's interested that the next deadline for data access applications is January 12th of 2022. Please visit the CLSA website under data access to review uh, all the available data as well as the additional details about the application process. Um, I'd also like to remind everyone to complete their anonymous survey upon exiting the Zoom session. Um, you should get that automatically. Um, in terms of the upcoming uh, CLSA webinar, uh, join us in the new year when we'll resume for the webinar series in January. Uh, we're still uh, figuring out our lineup so you can uh, monitor the CLSA website for that information. Um, and finally, remember that the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar. Um, so we invite you to follow us on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. Uh, thank you all for attending our webinars. Oh, 
today, but also the past year. And we really hope you have a safe and relaxing holiday season over the next several weeks. Thank you so much, everyone. And thank you, Samantha.